Polaski presenter superhero, uh, Steve Polaski, which uh, probably, he probably needs no introduction for most of you. Um, I, but just to highlight a couple of um, key kind of credentials of this very credentialed individual. Um, one is that he is a visiting Marsh professor, which is why we see him so frequently. And so he spends a week every year um, here, among other times when he's collaborating with folks at UVM. And so this has been his uh, week of one talk per day, roughly, um, is what it seems. And this is, I think, your culminating talk, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, and I thought, rather than go through Steve's many, many, um, uh, the, his whole life story and his CV, uh, just to note that he did come all the way from Minnesota to do this, so let's give him our, our full attention. Um, and that he's going to uh, convey at least one of the three superpowers that Taylor identified him with. Um, which were, let's see if I can get it right. He sees the simplicity in complex problems. He sees, uh, he's a very humble individual. And a superpower I didn't even really know existed. He's apparently very nice. So, <laughs> without further ado, here's Steve. Thanks. And we'll see if the superpower works. I am not going to do any PowerPoints or anything. Whoa! <laughs> so actually, I would love this. I know Taylor said, you know, don't go more than half an hour. I'm not going to go more than like one minute without you can interrupt any time. I'd rather have this as a discussion all the way through. And um, if you don't say a word, I'm, I won't say a word beyond 12:30. But but, um, but let's let's just have this as a discussion um, throughout. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about something that's called inclusive wealth. And, you, and some of you probably know what this is, and some of you probably I, you know probably don't know what this is, and you're probably saying, okay, what? Why did I come today? But um, <laughs> Uh, anyway, the, the background um, on this personally is that um, there's uh, a lot of work these days at the intersection of, uh, well, really about sustainable development and how do we know if we're, uh, how do we know if we're actually being sustainable um, or not? And, and so I actually teach a class um, with a whole bunch of people across different campuses and so I'm kind of intrigued in your, like, McGill and York and Vermont one. So we, we do a class on sustainability science, and it's across Minnesota and Arizona State and UNAM, which is in Mexico, and, um, and other people have been involved at their various times. Uh, Harvard's been involved and, and other places. And so, but anyway, one of the key questions there when you're doing sustainability science is like, well, what do you mean, first of all, what do you mean by sustainability, and you know, how would you actually have some type of evidence about whether you're being sustainable or not? And as part of that course, you know, we kept, there were kind of different ways that one could think about um, trying to come up with a metric of sustainability. And one of the ways that, um, out of economics, but, but then um, Bill Clark at Harvard, um, was not an economist, but said, you know, this, this, this method that economists came up with for pulling together data, this inclusive wealth metric, was sort of a way of really providing a coherent, consistent frame onto, um, onto uh, sustainability and, and, and doing it. So I want to go through this idea. And, well, the other background is this is a perfect time for me to talk about this because we're supposed to, I and um, uh, colleagues from Minnesota, so kind of my lab group at Minnesota, uh, we are writing a review paper on inclusive wealth that will get, as long as we don't butcher too badly, get published in annual review. So, so this is a uh, very kind for me to talk about because we're right in the, in the thick of it. Okay, so, you know, to, to me, the challenge, I, I just think of the, the challenge that we all face um, is the sustainability development challenge, right? You, we've got seven billion people now. We're going to nine to ten billion people. Um, those people want to live like people in Burlington. People in Burlington, even though you're eco-friendly, more friendly than the average American, uh, more friendly or better than the, what is it, the, uh, you know, the, but you're better than the average bear, right? Um, <laughs> um, e even so, you know, the question, um, 
kind of the clearest way of phrasing it is the Rockstrom et al. way of, you know, their planetary boundaries. And can we actually have 9 billion or 10 billion people trying to live a Western lifestyle on a finite planet without, you know, totally destroying the atmosphere, the oceans, uh, the land, and the rest of biodiversity that, that we currently have. Um, so, you know, that sustainability challenge. Um, and the question for some of us then on the scientific bent is, well, how do we know if we're actually meeting that sustainable development challenge or not, all right? We've got metrics in terms of, you know, GDP per capita. So I'm kind of on the economic side, you know, how well off uh, materially are people fine, but but um, there's a lot more to this than just you know how much energy is being produced and so forth. So the inclusive wealth idea is really asking the following. Um, I'm just thinking of your words. Try to find simplicity in a complex subject, right? But it's really trying to say, are we leaving to the next generation a set of assets that are that allow them to be at least as well off as we are, right? So are, are, we, are we leaving behind um, a set of things or a set of conditions that will allow them to thrive um, or do better than, than we are today? Or are we systematically disinvesting, be it in the natural world or in human capital or in other ways that would make it very difficult for them to live as well as we do, okay? So the idea of inclusive wealth then is, is to say across all different forms of capital or asset, not just the way economists typically talk, think of assets as like the buildings and the machinery and so forth, but, but the natural capital in all of its different dimensions, human capital, what do people know in their experience and education, um, uh, uh, social capital, um, be it institutions or relationships among people. So when you add up all of those capitals together, and now you're thinking, well, these are all apples and oranges and pineapples and pies and so forth, and you're right. The question is, so this inclusive wealth tries to come up with a consistent way of saying, when you aggregate all this stuff together, are you leaving behind more than um, what you started with? Okay. So there's, um, uh, I'll go through kind of the theory of at least how economists who came up with this uh, think about this, um, but then I want to spend time on the two real challenges. And um, there's to me, you know, economists oftentimes are, are guilty of, of this. They'll come up with this really like clean theory. It's like, oh, that's pretty cool. And then you know, you ask them, well, but how do you actually measure this stuff? And they'll go, well, that's not, you know, we, we just came up with a theory. It's, you know, colleges and others, you guys come up with how to measure this stuff. Uh, but I think there's a I think there's a real problem here because if the theory you know, ultimately again, I want to come back to the sustainable development challenge and I want to have something that tells me, you know, are we moving in the right direction or not? And if you can't measure this stuff, then you can't answer or address that question of whether you're moving in the right direction or not. So empirically, I think this is a, a huge challenge. And I'll give you um, some work that um, uh, a real superhero, Ken Arrow and a whole bunch of other people uh, did. Ken Arrow, Nobel Prize winner in, in, uh, in economics. And you know, I think there's a restriction you can only win it once, because otherwise I'm sure he would have won it multiple times. <laughs> anyway, so he's the closest thing that economists have to a superhero. Um, anyway, so he's done some work with other people recently, and they, they published, like, they were trying to take seriously, well, how would we actually measure inclusive wealth? Yeah. Just a quick question. Do people that look at that question look at a global scale? Or That's a great how do you question. deal with scale? Yeah, okay, so I think of this as important in a, at a global level, ultimately, right? Because you could always, you know, so, so there are lots of people who like look at the sustainability or sustainability metric for Burlington or for, you know, Vermont. And the difficulty here is that you can always subsidize a subsystem from the outside. Like, you can always make Burlington look better by, you know, pulling in things up. So ultimately, I think this is kind of a, it's most interesting to me at a global level. Although one can ask, and the arrow stuff that I just talked about actually is looking at 
national level. We're saying how well is India doing? How well is the U.S. doing in China? We have five countries. Uh, and they're all five. But Venezuela, for example, is one of them. But they, so they, they did it. They were kind of doing it at a national level. And actually, the reason why they did that is they were using national level income statistics that people put together. And so actually coming out of like GDP accounting, and then they're trying to extend it um, from there. But that's, yeah. to me, it's like globally, are we, we better not, but you can ask it within a smaller area. Yeah. OK. OK, so, um, so let me go just, uh, Oh yeah, no. I th there's two challenges I want to talk about. So one is empirical. The other is is um, thinking about equity. So this is another version of like what scale or what what are you doing? And so, you know, inclusive wealth is really kind of mashing together everything and saying overall are we, you know, leaving behind more than than, than we started with? But the other question is for whom? <laughs> you know, is this just on average? So would you say that we're doing well? You know that we've satisfied this inclusive wealth criterion if we um, uh, if on average people are doing better, but you know we've got 20% of the population and the poorest 20% and they're actually doing worse. Well, is that okay? Not. And so there are actually different answers um, on that. Um, and let me actually just talk about that um, right now, and then because I, I, I then I'll spend the rest of my uh, time talking mostly about the empirical um, challenge. So uh, there's two um, widely used definitions of, in, of approaches to um, the subject of kind of these sustainability metrics or inclusive wealth. So one, one on sustainable development, most of you have heard of the Brundtland Commission from 1987 on sustainable development, and it's basically that you know we need to have uh, in meeting current needs, we need to do that in a way which does not um, sacrifice the, the needs of the future. Right? We need to meet current needs, but do this in a way that we can also meet future uh, the needs of, of future generations. Right? So it's 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 needs, and, so, and and you can make an argument that there's equity built into that because if you're actually not meeting the needs of a uh, significant portion of the population, then you would argue that you have not actually met the Brundtland definition of sustainable development. So I'd argue that the Brundtland, a way of reading the Brundtland um, definition is, is that um, it has some built-in equity considerations in it. And certainly since it was done um, from the first, uh, this is kind of a prelude to lead up to um, for the Rio conference in 92, I mean this was published in 87, but you know, that, that there, there was, of course, a, a, a large development component in thinking about meeting the needs of people in, um, in developing countries. In theory, at least, a capital asset, the value of it should be related to how much value it is creating in the future. So a simple example, think about um, uh, a house that you're going to rent out to people. So the service that's created, the benefits created, people living in the house, they pay rent. And then you think about well, what's the house worth? And the simplest answer in economics would be, well, the house is worth basically the present value of the rent that it, that it could generate. Um, and so they're going to use this kind of idea that the current value of the current price of capital captures basically its, its value. And if you look through time, then the value of all these assets, if they're going up, then you're basically answering the question, well, so I'm leaving behind more things so the future generations are sort of more capable of, of having higher welfare than the present. Um, and that's the essence of what they're going to do. So they're really looking at <coughs> assets, how much, and the price of assets. Okay? Um, now there's all kinds of flaw, you know, there's all kinds of imperfections. You know, there's reasons why capital's prices don't actually fully so, so you know, one can criticize at a at a very um, this is one criticism at an empirical level of, of of the problems. But a more fundamental problem, and this is what I'll spend more time on, is that only certain things have prices in economic systems. Right? 
again, isn't the whole problem with ecological economics, environmental economics, however you want to call it, that um, we don't have prices for things that we know are valuable, right? Clean air, clean water, biodiversity. All of these things don't have prices. So the trick then empirically in what they want to do is to come up with um, what they call shadow prices. Very fancy name. Actually, it's a really good name on Halloween to talk about. We talk about shadow prices. <laughs> it's great. I've never given this talk on Halloween before. I didn't really realize how appropriate this was. Ooh, shadow prices. <laughs> um, okay, so you know what are shadow prices? Well, shadow prices is just a fancy name for saying we need to come up with the analog for price for things which don't have market prices. So what is uh, what's clean water worth? What's the amenity value, the, the beautiful views in Vermont? What are these things worth to people? How do they contribute um, to their well-being? How do we come up with estimates um, of that? Okay, so in theory, when you write this all down, you say, you know, you, you can, you know, the, the okay, I'm gonna, I'm, gonna ex, I'm gonna expose my biases, but there, there are, uh, uh, um, theorists in economics who basically say, well, we've written down all of these elegant things and, and, and we've shown, you know, that an increase in assets is equivalent to satisfying this um, non-declining wealth, which isn't satisfying the, you know, if you, all you need to do is, is to show that and you've proven that you're on a sustainable development path. So our work is done. And I look at it and I go, well, all you've done is basically take some simple theory and plug it into this area, and all of the hard work, you know, 99% of the work is actually then coming up and trying to empirically measure these things in a credible way. Um, so I guess I'm one of those messy empiricists now who wants to actually uh, actually put some uh, meat to the to the bones of this. So I have a question about yeah. this. Well, so it seems like. It could be inclusive in the temporal sense, so we can't decline these assets over time. Yep. But it's also inclusive in the kind of lateral sense today that you need to include all these things that typically aren't priced in markets. Yep. Is the definition of inclusive wealth both those things? Yes. Broad today and considering tomorrow? Yeah. So so the real thing, like this is the difference between like when we in our work when we talk about natural capital versus doing ecosystem services. So ecosystem services are the flows and the values that are coming out now. The natural capital, you're basically saying these are the assets that will lead to flows potentially well off into the future. And so from an inclusive wealth point of view, you want to worry about the capital, the natural capital part of this. But does anybody do inclusive wealth ignore natural capital? They just want to no. do inclusive wealth about like copper or something that's <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? So funny you should mention it. So now let's go to the empirical, okay. which is the this is this is the arrow at all. And so you know, arrow Nobel Prize winner and other authors on this are very bright, you know, super team, you know, League of Justice in their own right. <laughs> um, so, you know, they did a study and they were trying to do inclusive wealth where they actually said, No, we're I mean the point of inclusive wealth is that you actually try to be inclusive, that you actually try to cover the whole gamut of what are assets that would lead to human well-being. Yeah. Okay, I'm not even going to get into trying to measure social capital, which everything that I say here about natural capital, amp it up for social capital, it's far worse or harder or whatever. Um, but even in natural capital, you, you, I think you'll see, the, you'll see the problems here. Can I ask a quick question about sure. the longitudinal over time thing? Mm -hmm. So when you're looking at the value of an asset, a natural capital asset, right. is it the current value or yes. the future value? Because I, okay. I can imagine as those assets decline, an increase in value, and that could get that so, can make it look like you're being sustainable when you're not. Right. Um, okay. No. So it's a really good question there. So um, and I'm obviously skipping over the theoretical blah blah blah. It would take probably. 20 minutes just to do that, and most of you would have eyes glazing over it. But um, the point of this theory, though, is actually, okay, so to really be sustainable development, I would say, ultimately, really what you want to know is that people in the future are at least as well off as people now, right? That's kind of the basic core definition. So in, in a way, it's like, so economists would say it's non-declining welfare through time, right? 
Well, if you go through just a little bit of simple math, although it takes some gearing up, so that's why I don't want to do it. But it basically, you can show that if you have all these assets which lead to future provision of these flows of things that people care about, and you say, well, if the value of those assets, which actually reflect the future flow of services, if that's not declining, then the future flow of services is not declining. So all we have to do is kind of a shortcut. I don't actually have to measure what, or predict what, or know necessarily what people have in the future. I just look at the current price of those assets. You know, the current price of those assets should reflect those future values or those future benefits that are created. Now again, if you're critical of this, this would be one place to be critical, because you'd say, well, what if people don't have correct predictions about the future? So let's think about thresholds, for example. So I have current prices for things, and if I start to actually drop the level of the assets a little bit, and all of a sudden the world changes, and now the services are really different. So people have to be pretty forward-looking and intelligent and kind of actually have a correct prediction about what, how this will unfold. So once you start into this, you go, we have to know a whole lot more than we do now, or you have to have great faith that those current prices actually are capturing what you think they're doing when you write down the, the simple theory. So, so one thing that you, know, you should probably be skeptical about is do these prices really capture what, even the market prices that we have right now, do they really capture what you think of as being important for determining future well-being? So I'm beginning to wonder if inclusive wealth is divided by population. So is that a per person thing? Yeah, so you, you, you can do, so yeah, there is, um, you want to do this, I think it only makes sense on a per capita basis. Right? So you want to know is the, is the I mean, either on average or, or by group, are people in the future going to be better off than they are today? So individual, so that would be per capita, not, not trying to measure like, here's the total gross sum of wealth. So um, there are ways to, um, you know, you can adjust this. For example, I'm going to talk about this arrow paper um, uh, in just a moment. Um, the way they talk about this is you, you take the total numbers that you have, like the total wealth numbers, but then if you do this over time, you say, well, how has population changed? So now we'll have the wealth per capita numbers, and we'll look at how those have changed and what's affected those. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so let me do the, um, the, uh, the arrow and all run through. And uh, this is probably where I probably should have used a slide. I could have just thrown lots of numbers at you. Uh, but I think it's more instructive. This way I get to, I get to, I get to cherry pick which numbers I want to <laughs> show you. <laughs> so, um, actually their charts are scary enough anyway, so. So that would have been good on Halloween. I could put yeah. scary charts, right? <laughs> spooky. Yeah. Actually, what's really spooky about this, again, I, I, I said that these the people who did this paper, are, I really respect them, and I really respect them for trying to take this on because they went further, you know, so there's a joke in a Stockholm group that I spent a lot of time with. The ecologists in the group always really complained that the economists are always like, Oh, we've done this before. It's all been done. It's all simple. Like, and the theory is like simple and straightforward. And then you get to the empirical part, and you go, oh, God, this is really a mess. And, and do you really believe that the prices are really capturing what you think? And what about non-convexities and thresholds and blah, blah, blah? And it's like, oh, no, no, we, 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 this has all been done. Right. So OK, so you get to the empirical stuff. So, so Arrow and all were brave enough to go out of theory land and, and empirically try to measure. So I give them a lot of credit. But then I had a, a um, so when I team teach the sustainability course, I'm team teaching with Jeanine Cavender Bear, who's an ecologist, and, and she was trying to be really nice because she didn't know whether or what I thought of. She was trying to be really nice. And tell us. But there's nothing here that an ecologist would recognize as ecosystem services or natural capital. It's like you're talking about inclusive wealth, and, and you left off everything that we talk about. And so, the categories of what they did in, in inclusive wealth um, were 
Um, and this is, I think I mentioned earlier, they were building off of the um, income, national income accounting. You know, so if you do the system of national accounts and what comes up with GDP and so forth, you know, these are things, so the accountants are straightforward. They tell you the only things that count in GDP are things that have a market price. Copper, iron, gold, lead, nickel, phosphate, zinc. We got some minerals. Great. We have timber. Um, I think in some of this, you know, there's also like agriculture. Um, and then on one of the accounts on here, they also uh, did carbon. Everybody does carbon, right? We were joking about this before. It's like, okay, if I want to do ecosystem service and I don't really want to have to work too hard, I can do carbon. Um, but there's nothing here about air quality, water quality, biodiversity, pollination. Well, pollination would show up if it's, it's showing up an egg, right? So, so you wouldn't attribute it to nature, but it would show up um, as, as agriculture. Right? Okay, but, but actually if the bees decline, um, now, which means that agriculture in the future is going to be less productive, unless the people are smart enough to know this and have it reflect into some prices, then it doesn't show up. So again, it comes back to this question of how, how much are people actually knowing about it and actually capturing it into, into prices. Okay, so, so there you have it. We have, we have oil and natural gas, we have minerals, and we have timber. Right? Does that seem like inclusive of natural capital to you? No. I mean, so the point is, they, you know, there's all this stuff about thinking about shadow values, but, but they didn't do any shadow values. None of the ecosystem services are done. Okay, so, you know, for me, I'm thinking, boy, this is really unsatisfying. I mean, great theory, but we don't have any way to actually empirically go forward. Um, that's kind of the state of things right now. Actually, where I was on Wednesday was not, this was one of my four talks in four days, but it was not here. But um, So the World Bank has a group um, called WAVES, which is Wealth Accounting and Valuation of Ecosystem Services. So they're actually trying to figure out, maybe do a better job than here, of trying to incorporate natural capital and ecosystem services into national income and wealth accounts. Um, and so we were talking with them about how and there's a lot of experimental programs going on in a variety of countries around the world to, to, to try to do a better job. So this is ongoing work now. Um, it's at a level that's between, you know, maybe a little bit beyond where ERA was, but we're still at, at very kind of unsatisfactory um, uh, capabilities at, at the moment. So the other approach, um, and then I thought we should shut up, um, and we're, we're going to have a discussion, is um, the other approach is to do much more of the work um, that Taylor and I and colleagues have done, which is in the Natural Capital Project, looking very much at regional or kind of local regional scale analyses, take very seriously the ecosystem services, the ecological production functions, and to try to be quantitative as we can about these. Okay, so we, I think, can do a better job of saying really what is the impact of various actions or changes um, in the ecosystem on how well, or how, you know, how, 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 how well does it, uh, say, filter nutrients, so what's the impact on water quality, the carbon sequestration, the habitat, um, how well would species do, pollination, got a kick-ass pollination model due to Taylor and, and uh, Eric Lonsdorf and, and others. So, but the problem, I mean, the critique then back to us is, yeah, but you guys are doing local scale analyses. How do we make this, comp and over a few services, so how do we make this comprehensive and cohesive and inclusive and be able to do this at large scales? Fair challenge, I don't think, I don't know, Taylor, if you think we've answered that. I don't think we've answered that. I mean, you know, at least I feel good about the stuff that we do. I understand it, and I think it actually does incorporate um, a wider set of ecological functions along with economics and trying to link to benefits and show how valuable it is to people. But but we're not we're not at scale, and we're not covering all, I mean, we wouldn't claim, you know, we don't have as our title the Inclusive Natural Capital Project. It's sort of the Natural Capital Project, right? I mean, this is what we do, and yes, we would love to be doing more, but um, but we don't cover everything, and we're pretty explicit about that. So my takeaway right now is that 
that um, this is this inclusive wealth approach. It's actually a reasonable way to think about how to organize your thoughts about this, but as an empirical way to answer the question of are we doing better? Are we actually on a sustainable trajectory or not? You can't tell from this literature. It does not help you with that answer as of now. Um, and to me, that's very unsatisfying because then, because that to me was the whole, that's what I started with is the motivation um, for doing this. So, so we either have to, uh, um, you know, be a lot smarter and, and pull in a lot more. And I'll keep trying to do that because I don't want to give up on this yet. But, um, and also because I don't know what the alternative is. You know, I don't know what other answer we have necessarily that's, um, that's better. And I think most of the things that you could complain about in inclusive wealth, you could also complain about with, you know, GPI or other things like how do we aggregate these things up and do you have the right set of categories and, and so forth. But um, I, anyway, so I think it's a unavoidable that we actually keep, keep trying, but that there is a lot of work to do. I don't think we have adequate sustainability with that sustainable development metrics as of now, and I think we really need them. So, I will stop with my comments with that, and now we can have a scary discussion about this. <laughs> yeah. So I'm curious about the global nature of that analysis and the, how that will be used, and I think of people who are actually gonna do something about sustainability as working on much smaller scales, like maybe this is a question that's just not that useful to answer because it's too hard and people aren't going to use it and we probably know the answer, which is no, we're not doing a good job. Right. I don't know. What do you think? Um, well, that's good. You just justified my <laughs> choice of like, why do we work at local and regional scales? I'm just throwing that so out I'm there. Happy. Right. Um, I think if you had something that, that basically said that, that you could use as a diagnostic tool, I could see as actually being quite, I mean, if you could do this, I would actually think that there was a lot of uses for it. In other words, so, so let's just take an example. Suppose we could say, you know, over the last few years, we've actually been unsustainable of following, you know, quantitatively, here's how far down, you know, here's how many Earths we've, you know, gone, gone down with, um, or portions of the Earth. Uh, and here's why. It was these components of the analysis that led you down this thing. It was the fact that you did deforestation and that you used up fossil fuels and put this much into the atmosphere. That that's, these are the, like the, you know. Drivers. Yeah, yeah. These are the dirty dozen or something, right? These are the drivers of it, and here's how you'd have to change those in order to bring them back into uh, being consistent with sustainability. Yeah, I just, I just think about when, if, if a global number came out, people would be blaming each other, it would, unless it's part, somehow the blame is portioned out. I, I, I can just, I think it's really interesting and it would get people's attention, but I don't know if it would actually make people do things differently. <coughs> I don't know. Yeah, I don't no, know. I think it's, it's fair questions. I mean, actually, Taylor and I just had this discussion. I don't know if you were being facetious or if I'm putting words in your mouth. You know, it's kind of like, why are you heading off to DC tomorrow anyway? <laughs> yeah, you know, what good is this stuff? I mean, you know, who cares about G and GDP and whatever? And um, I have this thought too. It's like, well, why? Why do we keep reporting? I mean. When you do something on a local scale, and like most of our analyses in the Natural Capital Project are, well, if you organize the landscape in this way, or you organize it that way, or if you put best management practices here, here are the set of consequences that follow. Right. And it actually is at the scale where it is a landowner, or it's a municipal government, or somebody that could imagine you know, doing zoning laws differently, and here are the set of consequences that follow from that. And so you can imagine, right? Uh, yeah, the idea is it's really easy to see how you go. I don't know. I mean, I don't. Maybe people in the room have an opinion about this. Like, I don't manage. I think my it'd be life. a great nature paper, but I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, it's a fair question, right? I mean, I never made a decision based on the latest GDP numbers, and I don't know right. anybody else who does either. But every time, well, what was your experience? You raised this question. I have the same critique about waves about there's this fight to include natural capital into the systems of national accounts that countries report. Right, and I, I can't 
keep asking about who's going to use that and make a decision differently if we succeed perfectly. Right. And it's the answers have never been all. Maybe the people have better answers, like GPI people have better answers, but no one, people, um, the answers are really pathetic. They're really scammery and they don't really know. And they, I think if you're going to you know, put millions at the World Bank into this, you have the crispest answer in the world for this. And they don't. So if anybody here does, that'd be great. But it falls into the same category, I think. Like, why measure the planet? Who's going to act differently with that information? Other than to know what we already know, which is. I think we've got several people who are yeah. going to jump in here. So. <laughs> well, I'm wondering if you can do like a comparative analysis, where you take, let's say, regions, which make it a little bit larger scale than, let's say, what ha what's happening with Vermont. So let's say you take. Um, Maine, Massachusetts, and Vermont. And you put them into a group, and you put that. We'll leave out New Hampshire. We all know why. We all know why. It goes without saying, right? Well, there are actually reasons why. I, I, because I was, I was thinking about a, a relative population that then you would compare to another regional partner, which is acting under different policies, i.e., Quebec. So if you leave out New Hampshire, Rhode Island, Connecticut, you actually get. A different population, which okay, and then the other thing would be just to maybe take a, a Washington State and British Columbia. You know, so you've got their various different policies. You know, maybe you take uh, Switzerland and you, you compare it again, again. You know, maybe more with the Quebec side because it's you know Alpine yeah. economy, etc. Those sorts of things, and then by creating sort of. Um, you know, a little bit larger generalizable yeah. metrics, and then create just creating means of comparison. Yeah. Again, it's very fuzzy. Right. It's not. You, you, you know, but Karen, coming back to your point, I mean, you could think about doing the inclusive wealth of Burlington, the inclusive wealth of Vermont, and I, and I, I'd be perfectly happy with if, you know, again, if people could do this, you know, reverse way or credible way. Um, and going on in China and then being exported to the rest of the world. And you say, well, you know, China's got 29% of global uh, carbon emissions now. And, uh, aren't they, you know, the kind of feeling is, aren't they bad? And it's like, okay, but yeah, if you really deconstruct that and go, where is the carbon, you know, for whom are those carbon, you know, the embodied carbon, where is that going? Well, it's, you know, going back to the U.S. and China and, I mean, Europe and elsewhere. So, uh, so as long as you kept track of kind of, again, kind of, in a way, apportioning the blame. Of are there cl are there yeah. good tools for doing that? Yeah, actually, there's been a lot of pretty really. There's been some really interesting papers, and um, for for many things, again, you're kind of subject to what do people keep track of. So if you're really looking at goods that get traded internationally, you can talk about the embodied water or the embodied carbon or other things, and talk about where the trade flow is going, and so where does it. Where does the production happen and where does the consumption happen and how the trade flows tying those two together. So for some statistics, you, know, you, can, you can do it. Okay, now I've seen a whole bunch of hands and I have no idea who it was first, so I'll just start up at this corner and then we'll go, go back. And John, I see your hand, so you're, you're, we'll, get, we'll get back there eventually. Okay. So just to start with that question you're asking is pretty shocking. I mean, I think if political leaders are not using that information, it's time for revolution. So that's just the starting point. It's like if it's not good for the politicians, it'll be good for the rest of us to know that stuff because it's time to change the way things are working. And that comes, brings me back to the point I wanted to get to, which is um, one of the things that concerns me a lot <coughs> in the academic setting is that I don't hear political economy coming out. I don't hear um, discussions of, well, how do you make the transition <coughs> to uh, steady state economics a, politically viable. I mean, you have, you have a huge, just unbelievable momentum uh, toward the wealth-based economy. And I'm waiting, I'm waiting for the uh, ecological economists, steady staters, to start to get out in the streets and, and talk about what we can do to change people's minds, to make help people realize that the only real wealth is social and human capital and a healthy environment 
and that it's time to change from a wealth-based security system to a human humanity and um, ecologically healthy based security system. And just to p punch something I'm pitching, pitch something to everybody here, I would personally like to be involved in developing an economics radio program which took something like, it was a counterpoint to marketplace, where we go, okay people, <laughs> it's growing and it's not good. <laughs> not marketplace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the marketplace antidote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that's not really a question. I'm sorry, I throw a lot at you. Oh, What's on my mind? Yeah, fine. Oh. Hey, straw man. Uh, <laughs> Arrow, Dasgupta, Mailer, they're all smart people. They're all about 80 years old. And if they don't embrace what Costanza did in 1996 in uh, Nature, with the first paper about global natural capital, and everything that's come since, forget them. What about young economists? Why quote these guys? And, and what was the year of that paper? What was the year of the paper that they... This one is 2012. Okay. They are a paper. All right. They're out to lunch, so why bother with them? <laughs> <laughs> You're about to die anyway. It's a combative corner. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you sorry yeah. to start with yeah. John? Get the super young Come on. <laughs> Should have started with John back in that <laughs> uh, Okay, you know, you can... <laughs> Valid point. <laughs> John, no. <laughs> you got it, man. I'm with you. Go ahead. What's the next question? <laughs> so, actually, if you want to go back before Costanza, if you want to go back to the mainstream people, uh, so Nordhaus and Tobin had, in the 1970s, a measure of economic welfare that actually did most of the stuff that we're talking about right here. But, you know, they're not, they're not, they're not candidates for non-market radio, um, but they actually talked about this. And so the, I, think a, I think a fair question is, why hasn't what's been out there for a long time? I mean, you know, nature is hardly a radical publication. Um, and Nordhaus and Tobin are not radical economists. So why, since it's been out there and people will talk about it, and anybody who, any economist that you would talk to says, you know, GDP is not a welfare measure. I'm like, mm -hmm, I know that. Um, and so, I mean, try it, right? I mean, you know, if, if, they, if they don't, tell them, write to me, and I'll, I'll report them to the <laughs> uh, but, but it's a fair question I think both of you are asking, which is, look, we all know, but maybe we unlearn it sometimes, about what's really important in life. And so why isn't, you know, why should this be such a struggle to say that, you know, the social concerns and the environmental concerns are really central to well-being. It's the point. Right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Brendan, you have? Yeah, I was just going to go back to the global thing and just have two points. One of them is, is back to your talk on uh, whenever the other day was Tuesday. Um, <laughs> so, like, globally, we, we could track the ozone layer, and we have, and it's like, oh, well, this is a global measure of atmospheric health. And when that indicator starts to tank and we can see a visual picture of actually there's a giant hole here, we did act, we acted quick and there was a whole bunch of moving parts and Steve got into a bunch of them the other day of why that tracking that global thing mattered. The thing that I have a problem with with the indicators of sustainable economic welfare or even inclusive growth and wealth kind of goes this way, inclusive wealth, is that then we try to like combine these things together. And then all of a sudden it loses its meaning. It's like, so let's just pretend we had atmospheric health in there with um, agricultural land and pollinators. And well, our, our atmosphere could be tanking, but the thing that gets reported at the end, if everything else is going up, then that's a, you know, it loses some. So why aren't we, my thought is like, let's just keep tracking those five things or whatever that are really important and keep an, you know, keep an eye on them rather than trying to collapse them and be a, so. Anyway, so, yeah. so, so I will uh, talk about several other superheroes, at least in the kind of realm here. So Sen and Stiglitz and Fatuzzi had a paper, book, report that they, they were commissioned by the French government to go, you know, moving beyond GDP. And other. Basically, in the end, they came up, and they, they were well aware of this inclusive wealth literature, 
And they said, too much, for exactly the reason that, uh, so you should win a Nobel Prize, because this is exactly the conclusion. <laughs> I'm looking for Wimbledon. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's about as likely as a Nobel Prize. <laughs> So true. <laughs> Next year I'm gonna be Arrow for Halloween. <laughs> so the superhero or the <laughs> Okay, so um, it, anyway, where they came out was basically to say it is too much. You know, we do not have we don't have good ways of coming up with these shadow prices, shadow values. Um, the the even if we did, the, you know, would they actually be informative in the way of really telling you like how is this leading to future well-being? You know, is that is it really I mean, really what you're saying if you're taking this price approach like these guys do is you're saying that's a sufficient statistic for future well-being? And many people would say eh, that's a really flimsy uh, basis there. Um, so what they said is, you know, look. You can report some things in GDP terms, in monetary terms, whatever. I mean, we've got some things, and it, it, it's informative for some reasons. It's not inclusive, and there's these other things that it clearly leads out, leaves out. So why not have a system of like physical accounts for the natural capital? So you know, important things like on the atmosphere or on the habitat or biodiversity, you keep track of as a separate um, set of accounts, and that's. You know, their analogy was, in a car, you know, you don't have one thing that tells you everything. You, know, you actually have a speedometer and a heat thing that tells you how hot the engine is and the gas gauge and everything else. So you don't have just one metric. And, and trying to combine these things into one metric is not meaningful, as you said. Um, a challenge, and I've seen this too in times when I, so I was at Council of Economic Advisors for a year. And, and so we got passed through us all of the things on um, like cost benefit analysis of the Clean Air Act, for example. And EPA would do its best, but there's this hierarchy within these reviews. It's like, okay, is it monetized? And some things can't be monetized. Is it quantified? Some things can't even be quantified, but you know it's important. And you know what happens to the ones that are like fuzzy out there? It's like, they don't show up in the bottom line of the report, and it's kind of like everybody says, and you can say it a hundred times, like this is really important, it's really important, it's really... and it, at the end of the day, it kind of gets lost, right? And so this is kind of the, I struggle with this. It's like, do you want to quantify things that are really difficult to quantify, and you might be doing grave injustice in doing that, or do you, you know, say it's these other categories, and then you're trusting the politicians or decision makers to actually keep in, their head that these things are important. And the social side is frankly even worse than the natural side. We know that the social relations are important and things like that. And, we, and we're even worse there in terms of quantification. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so John. Um, I mean, you present this with two conflicting options there. One is like, let's just do more of the same. Let's just become better at measuring. Let's just get bring in more and more of the services and kind of accept this definition of sustainability. And the other, which I, I hear you kind of going back and forth, the other is let's just throw all this out. Like this is stupid and it doesn't work and we'll never be able to know we'll with, able to with enough precision to make in, in, informed decisions. And even if we do, the decision makers probably won't even use it, is what I hear Taylor say. So, <laughs> um, and ecological economics provides a really useful critique towards the throw it out aspect, when it says that we've got to be really careful when we kind of build off of Brendan's point, important complementarity relationships between our natural capital stocks and all these other things. And then just to build on Brendan's point, um, don't we have really good indicators that come from a more scientific basis, like parts per million of, of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, that help us understand that we're, we're beyond where we'd like to be that help us sort of uh, create a quantitative metric to say we are on an unsustainable path and help us set a target like a parts per million target mm -hmm. and then the role of the economist becomes how do we achieve that target in the most cost-effective way right. versus the role of the economist to be let's figure out what that target should be right. which is which is 
probably elevating the economist to a superhero that we don't want. <laughs> well, we can't support. <laughs> um, no, these are really good questions. Let, let me give you the pros and cons. Um, yes, because this is, I mean, you know, you've been through this too, and you can, you know, keep, jump in, okay? Um, or anybody else in the room? No. Okay. But <laughs> let me, let me before here. you jump. <laughs> Let me, Not yet, Superman. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, go ahead, Bob. <laughs> Scandinavia, yeah. Norway, particularly, has parallel physical accounts to yes. go along with their economic accounts. And there's even this joke that you know some people are just not smart enough to keep track of four or five numbers at once, but Norwegians are, so they keep them separate. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. All right. All right. So I mean, that that is a way of doing. It. In fact, you know, in many of these things, it's like. I mean, I always joke, even in the kind of work that we do where we're not trying to be comprehensive, whatever, and people, you know, are pushing us, like, well, you know, you should put, you know, if you're cleaning up the air and fewer people are dying, you should put that in monetary terms. They go, why? Isn't it more effective as a communication device to say, you know, we're going to save a thousand lives versus we're going to save, you know, a thousand times six million, we're going to save, you know, six billion dollars in this. It's like, you know what? I think the health number directly is more salient to people. Fine. And then this is this gets back to the point, you know, Brendan, you raised about it's like look, let's have a series of accounts that basically if I mean you can you can see how this would not be too complicated, maybe even for American politicians, where you actually had, you know, a, you kind of warning lights. Right? I mean that's again the analogy of the car. It's like, oh you're low on gas or you know your engine's overheating. Like the climate is overheating, you know? Yeah, that hasn't worked very well yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the, the simplest story we can tell. It's a global number, and it should be global, and it's still not going to I know. Yeah. But, I, you know, but, to, but to Steve's point, I mean, by continuing to couch it in an economic argument, it almost gives um, the current system uh, the ammunition to dodge, dodge the bullet, to dodge the, the real scientific critique, which is, a, you know, for example, a parts per million critique. And, a climate treaty that needs to be signed and an actual physical number that we're trying to achieve versus kind of all of these you know costs and benefits and models and the dice and the Nordhaus and you know and and, and then we fall we, we fall into a trap of if we only had better numbers we could make better decisions and I, I'm not yeah. I'm not I think we could be doing that for decades while I, mean, I, I our own work on Lake Champlain, like we're getting a better and better and better and finer and finer description of how we've destroyed the lake. <laughs> but that's not helping us make a better decision. <laughs> we're, we're doing ever better and being ignored. I mean, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, I, I, I really do think there's a th there's one element here that it, I mean, I'm basically with you on the physical accounts. I, I find the keeping track of the really. I mean, it has to be a small number. It has to be something like five. It can't be five hundred or even fifty. Um, and that's, you know, sometimes where you get these lists of sustainable development metrics that are, you know, 150 or 200. It's like, you know what? It's, that's, that's not effective. If it's five, that's effective. So then the question is, well, how do you get it down to five? Because we know that there's a huge number of dimensions of things that actually are important, right? So I would put a filter on it and say, well, what are things that really matter, right? I mean, they really matter in the sense of how would this affect uh, future generations? You know, is this something like climate change? Clearly, you say yes. This has potential to radically alter welfare of future generations. But, but, but that's a finer, you know, the economist, you don't even have to have economists do that, right? You know, you're basically just saying, it's just a filter of, is this going to matter at a very big scale? And if it's a minor thing, then you put it into the second tier of things, but you probably don't have it as your first five metrics. Maybe that's just one, that's one suggestion. Um, you had a, a story or a comment in your talk about colleges saying we've done it all before. <laughs> the economists. Oh, the economists said that. Yeah. Okay, well, I'm going to reverse that and say that I think the ecologists have done some of this before. Um, I'm listening to the debate about trying to collapse multiple indicators down into indices and things like that. And I'm thinking that in ecology, in ecology I'm an ecologist, we, we had that debate actually in the late 80s and the early 90s. There was this huge debate about indexes of, of uh, ecological health and ecological stress and there was the suitor versus shaper at all debate that went back and forth and we sort of re resolved that and moved on and then we 
uh, had a decade looking at what you guys are talking about right now, like scorecards, for instance. You know, that led to the Heinz Center uh, scorecard on ecosystem health and all that sort of thing. And I just feel like we've been down this road before. And so if you guys are circling back to scorecards of, you know, sort of physical and environmental metrics, um, we've done that. <laughs> and it hasn't gotten us anywhere either. So I actually don't see that as either groundbreaking or a solution. <coughs> I'm sorry, but I don't. So, what's, so, what's, what, so what would you instead? <laughs> well, I mean, I think that if you, I was intrigued by the idea of wealth, which to me, I mean, actually, you mentioned the Brundtland Commission, and I'm still not clear how that differs from their idea of intergenerational equity. I mean, we've sort of had a different term for that already, and I actually think intergenerational equity is more appealing in some ways. I think it's more understandable for a lot of people. Anyway, whatever you want to call it, that's different. You know, so now we're saying that these physical indicators that we've measured for a long time, that they really mean something for intergenerational equity, and really they're a form of wealth that we really need to track. That really is different than people. So the question is how do you do that? Right, but then it comes idea. back to, you know, John, you were, I think, getting really to this point about sort of strong sustainability, weak sustainability. So, so the, for those of you who haven't heard these terms, the strong sustainability argument basically says, in order to be sustainable, you have to maintain each category, you know, each critical category to a certain level. It can't be, it has to be non-declining within category. Weak sustainability says, all I care about is intergenerational equity or well-being in the future, and so individual categories can go down as long as the whole contribution of the package of asset leads people as a lot. But then you get to the question of, can you judge that adequately? And I think, you know, that's, where I think ecological economists oftentimes come in and say, well, it's just too hard to do. It's better to be precautionary or a safeguard and say you want to do the important critical categories. Okay, just like you've been doing. This is a very final question. question. Yeah, sorry. No, not me. Michael. Okay. Oh, final one, yeah, Michael. Well, actually, I was going to summarize a little bit of what we were talking about quickly because it seems like, well, you started out by mentioning the set of indicators. You talked about the Rockstrom article. Mm -hmm. And that's a great attempt to put nine, I think, is their number of categories of criteria that provides our space a safe operating space, right? So it seems like we're talking about a few different things. One is integrating that type of reporting into national accounts. And I think that, you know, if ecologists could get together and say, these are, we think, the seven, eight, five, nine, whatever it is, most important global indicators, that, if you can start reporting on a national level, provides something useful, provides that, you know, red warning light in the dashboard, you don't want to fly the plane only with the odometer, right? So that's one part of it, and that seems like something that ecologists could rally around the Rockstrom paper, you could rally around some other set of indicators, and then you could push it as a political agenda at a global scale. You get into the national accounting, that allows you to actually start tracking things. I think that provides an opening for a lot of interesting studies to connect things like nitrogen loading or phosphorus loading with other ecosystem services that we know are quite important. And that provides almost a way of developing a finer grained understanding of how those broad indicators actually translate into ecosystem health at a much finer scale. But then I guess to answer the first question, why does it matter globally? I think it matters fundamentally at a global scale because basically you're talking about justice between nations. And when you start getting to managing things like climate change, what's derailed all of our attempts to do cap and trade globally? It's a question of, well, you caused the problem and I'm paying for it. And if you have that national accounting, it actually provides a basis for having a discussion about distributive justice. So you know, that's just my points, kind of summarizing a bit. Next final word. That was an excellent final word. <laughs> um, I suggest that you all flood Steve's email box with <laughs> inbox with all sorts of comments on inclusive wealth. This was an excellent discussion, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>